Hello and welcome back to seoleverage.com. My name is Gerd Melak. This is episode 89 of our podcast. At SEO Leverage, we're working with clients from all kinds of industries. Some of them are in the SaaS business, software as a service business, which is a particular field where SEO and content marketing in general, I think, is a little bit different than in other fields. Um, we do have a software in-house as well, so we have some... Um, development experience i myself was a have been a developer for more than 20 years already and i've just learned that we have a very common ground there with our guest today so we have invited kevin Sain from scrapebee.com scraping b sorry scrapingbee.com over to, to, to us to the podcast welcome kevin thanks for having me Gert. excited to be here awesome i really want to to tell about this um whole SaaS thing and and also where you come from your background could you give our listeners a little bit of a background on on how um you got your experience in in SaaS and the common ground i just mentioned with you sure so um i started my career as a uh, software developer so i went to um, um university in france um i I spent three years in university. Uh, at first, I wanted to pursue a master's degree, but after three years, I got kind of bored. Um, and, you know, I wanted to um, um, get some real world uh, experience uh, as soon as possible. And um, I joined a startup um, in France. The company I was working uh, with was doing, a, it's kind of a pled.com in the US, so kind of a bank account aggregation. And uh, we were doing a lot of web scraping um, because in order to uh, connect to uh, customers' accounts, unfortunately, uh, banks don't offer uh, any API. So um, uh, we had to programmatically extract uh, data. I really, uh, it was really... Um, uh, a great experience to learn about this world of uh, web scraping and also to to learn about the startup world because the startup I was working with was uh, in inside an incubator. So there was many, many different startups and they could speak to all these entrepreneurs uh, after work and go to these uh, meetups and uh, uh, workshops after work. And it was a uh, really um, uh, exciting and I was seeing lots of lots of different uh, companies, uh, and kind of um, started the the flame, the entrepreneurial uh, flame inside me. And um, uh, yeah, I mean that's where um, I knew that at some point in my life I would quit my job and, and launch a company. The company got uh, acquired. Unfortunately, I, I didn't have any. Uh, uh, stock or anything, but it um, it was really interesting to live uh, a big acquisition from the inside, and then to get some experience with the uh, acquiring company. Um, it was a big French bank, so I knew that the corporate world uh, wasn't for me. Um, but it was still interesting to you know learn how all this work. And then at some point, I just decided to um, not quit immediately, but first uh, start some kind of project. And I launched a blog. So it was my first experience with SEO. I launched a blog that uh, obviously talked about programming. This blog, um, I, I had I haven't any uh, ambition with it. I was just enjoying uh, writing a blog post after my work and talking about uh, uh, the things that I learned. And I, I think I got pretty lucky with this blog uh, because it got featured in big uh, tech publications uh, like the IntelliJ blog. So IntelliJ, for those who don't know, it's like the um, most uh, well-known uh, kind of text editor for developers. And it was uh, like it boosted my uh, my rankings and my domain authority and uh, like kind of uh, overnight. And um, this was my first uh, foot in the SEO world. And then uh, eventually I, I quit my job and um, worked on um, two, two, uh, two startups that failed. And then uh, with my lifelong friend, uh, Pierre de Wolf, I launched Scraping Bee and, uh, and here we are. Yeah, that's amazing. That's an amazing story. And I can see a lot of 
a lot of parallels from from starting out as a developer and working in com software companies and and launching and talking online about programming. I think if you type in my name, you'll still find some of my early forum questions and posts about my programming doubts, uh, which is interesting. Uh, personally, I also found very very soon that corporate is definitely not for me. Uh, also, always trying to do my own thing, but it's interesting how how a really technical uh, or, or tech focused job still drives you to entrepreneurship to through uh, to marketing just in order to make things work. I remember when I built my first website, I think it was like 15 or 16 years old. Um, I just found, okay, now I have a know-how to build a website. So so what are they going to do with it? Nobody comes, nobody's going to see it. Nobody talked about it. So let's see yeah. what this SEO thing is all about, right? So it's really interesting. So now this is scrapingb.com. Uh, can you very briefly tell us what you're doing there? Yeah, so... Um... Uh, I was mentioning the um, the, the failed uh, startup uh, we uh, we did before with my uh, partner. The, basically, previously we were um, working on an, a SaaS uh, business called PricingBot.co. So basically, what PricingBot was were it was um, a SaaS a price monitoring uh, tool for e-commerce owner to monitor their competitors. So basically, uh, you could enter your competitor. We would uh, crawl the domain and then extract all the data from the products, like the price, the description, the images, and we would track it every day so that you could have uh, alerting. You could see how your uh, products um, are priced compared to your competitors, uh, reprice dynamically your own product, etc. But we failed. Um, we failed for many reasons. One of the main reasons why we failed was that uh, we didn't uh, manage to um, uh, get a proper uh, distribution channel. Like uh, we couldn't uh, find a good way to beat the competition in the search engine. We couldn't find a way to uh, build a repeatable sales process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we didn't like manage to get past uh, one thousand dollar in MOR, which uh, wasn't great. So we decided to uh, shut down the company. We didn't really shut down, but we uh, sold it to one of our competitors uh, for uh, like a really small amount. The great thing about uh, this business was that we encountered lots of um, issues while doing the web scraping. Mm -hmm. So um, one of those issues is um, uh, what is called JavaScript rendering. So when you scrape the web at scale, um, there is a technical uh, problem that is uh, that you encounter um, more and more uh, nowadays. Is that there are more and more websites that are using um, a JavaScript frameworks uh, like uh, Vue.js, React, etc. And it's kind of hard uh, to scrape those websites because if you don't use a headless browser, you'll get basically an empty page because all the content is rendered uh, with JavaScript. So you need uh, a headless browser and scaling headless browser is hard. It, there are tons of issues like uh, it's a, a real um, uh, ops problem. It costs a lot in servers because you need powerful servers, etc. So we had solved this problem uh, with pricing bot. And the other problem that you have when doing web scraping at scale is proxy management. So you need proxies. For example, when you want to access internationalized content, if you want to see a price in euro on an international uh, online retailer, you need an IP address in the European Union, et cetera, et cetera. And the other uh, thing that you need uh, is that um, lots of websites that are going to block your request if you uh, um, do uh, too many requests uh, per day. or in, And if you want to do more than that, you need um, more IP addresses. So um, proxy management is also something that we solved with pricing bots. And so we, um, we, we, we thought that uh, we, there are more and more companies and startups that are extracting data in many different industries, uh, data from the web, I mean, and they probably all face the same problems. And we, we just thought that uh, if we could launch an API uh, that wraps and package uh, the two solution, uh, proxy management, and um, uh, JavaScript rendering, well, um, it could be used by lots of uh, companies in many different industries. And the other thing, so that was for the product. 
And for we thought that, okay, but we're not going to repeat the same mistake that we did with pricing bots. So having a, a product uh, is good, but we needed to have a way, uh, a repeatable way uh, to attract customers. And we already had this way because both my partner and I uh, had successful programming blogs and we knew that um, uh, we could easily rank for many keywords related to web scraping because on my personal blog, I already ranked for uh, some of those keywords and I had a pretty significant traffic already, like four or 5,000 uh, unique visitors a month. And we knew that we could probably uh, 10x uh, this uh, number if we spent more time and uh, wrote uh, more um, content about the, this topic. So, um, like we we spent a lot of time um, uh, working on launching this uh, this packaged uh, API, and like it um, from I would say I wouldn't say from day one, but like from months one, uh, we started uh, acquiring customers um, and at a rate that was uh, uh, significantly uh, higher than uh, uh, our previous project. Mm-hmm. It's a really really interesting story. So obviously. Appreciate you also also share the, the the failed startup here, and as always with every failed project, I have those in my my history as well. There are a lot of learnings, and very often new ideas just start from a, from a big failure, but you still can leverage the learnings you have in there. Yeah. Um. So I do I I do realize I, I did work I think for sixteen years on an e commerce project as well, uh, which we programmed from scratch back then, uh, and mm-hmm. I did a lot of price comparisons as well. So I can see where this was definitely a market. But I also know that even my client back then was really reluctant and in, in starting to implement this and, and trusting the automation, et cetera. I remember there were a lot of trust issues around, is this really scraping the right thing and how automated can we make those price adaptions? This is interesting. But I can see, yeah, definitely we have, we head into an era where more and more, more and more content is just rendered with JavaScript. It's not as easy to extract data anymore. And just a lot of company have this, this necessity. necessity. Um, I'm really interested in, in two things right now. Now we can talk about this startup. How, how did you get your first clients? Because I imagine you can't wait for SEO to just magically happen and start getting some rankings. You need some, some feedback on, on seeing your product out in the wild. How did you go about getting the first clients? So what we did with Scraping B is that we started the blog uh, four months um, uh, before uh, launching the product. Mm-hmm. So when we launched uh, Scraping B um, publicly, we already had um, some traffic on our blog uh, and pretty significant traffic, like uh, a few thousand visitors a month. So um, it really helped uh, during our launch uh, to acquire the first customers. We did the usual, you know, uh, a startup playbook, if I could uh, call it that way, for the launch, meaning we launched on uh, different uh, platforms. Um, we, we didn't do a, a one big launch, but we, we did a beta first. Uh, we announced the, the launch in beta in, you know, a beta list, product hunts, Reddit, Hack News, uh, all those uh, websites. And it helped us uh, get a an initial uh, email list of, I don't know, a couple hundred emails. Uh, so it helped us getting the first better users. So not, not paying users, but better users. And then when we decided to uh, publicly launch, it was in August 2019, um, we immediately uh, uh, got our first uh, customers. I think in the first months, we, we acquire like 10 customers, paying customers, uh, in August 2019, and then um, it's just um, you know I don't know I I would say that we probably um, at the time um, uh, acquire uh, between five and ten new customers every month, and then it started growing slowly but surely. Awesome! Well, that's just, that's really 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 good. Um, I like that you started the blog ahead of time. This is what I tell people when they sell Christmas baskets. You can't start in December with your SEO. You probably need to start in in, in spring or summer uh, to get yeah. those rankings in. Um, and we did a similar thing. Interestingly, we, uh, we I started the link building blog in Spain. 
when nobody mm -hmm. talked too much about link billing and nobody wanted to do link billing. And so yeah, if nobody wants to do it, I'm going to do it for them. So we ended up building links for quite a few agencies in Spain. And we started out with this link billing blog. And again, we, we built a blog way before we actually started launching the service, but we just got a lot mm -hmm. of traction. And very often you can leverage the content this way. Or, or sometimes we see even clients launch products once we audit their website. And tell them, look, you get a lot of traffic on this article, but you don't leverage it some anyhow. You don't do, get convers uh, conversions in. Many people don't even know what they actually rank for in terms of, of keywords. So very often, once you see what Google already gives you relevance, you can extract a completely new service or product for that, right? That's interesting. Uh, how do you go about the, or did you go about the content creation for this blog? Is there any, uh, did you, how much did you do the research or how did you, how did you go about creating those blog posts to get them ranked so well? So I would say that at the beginning, I, I kind of um, learned SEO at the same time as I was implementing it. Because um, when I started my blog, um, my personal blog, I mean, when I was working at uh, my first company, um, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just, you know, uh, write my thoughts about uh, uh, what I just learned, etc. When we launched Scraping B and when we start wor started working uh, on the blog, uh, I was reading a lot of things about SEO on the side, and it was really hard. Like I think, like the the problem with learning in uh, 2022 is that like there's too much information available and it's uh, like the most difficult thing is to uh, filter the noise um, and find you know the, the real information and and especially uh, in SEO that there there's so the first problem is that there are too much information available and the second problem is that there are lots of uh, experts or so-called experts in the industry that have completely different views on the same topic. Why? For a simple reason. The simple reason is that the Google algorithm is kind of a black box. So people are assuming things and um, like there are many experts that are assuming uh, different things or worse, opposite things. Um, so th that's what makes learning SEO um, uh, hard and then but i was uh lucky enough to um um find like uh good mentors uh along the way that helped me uh, focus on what matters and for me what matters there are two things that matters or three things that say keyword research content and link building uh so we focused on these those three to answer your question about the content uh at the beginning we were um, not really doing uh, a, a formal keyword research. We were um, taking um, the articles that were uh, working well on my personal blog and implementing variations of those articles on our uh, Scraping Me blog. For example, there was one blog post that uh, worked well on my personal blog, which was um, introduction to web scraping with Java. And so we did an introduction to web scraping with many, many different languages, JavaScript, Ruby, uh, Python, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it worked really well. And we didn't do any keyword research for this. We just, you know, we knew that it was working and like uh, uh, Python was a big language. So why not uh, do a web scraping article about Python? And it was um, uh, uh, well after when we... Um, exhausted all those uh, variation that we started to um, uh, learn about uh, keyword research, how to do it, how can we um, uh, focus on um, counterintuitive um, uh, keywords, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, for the content itself, uh, we wrote everything by ourselves uh, at the beginning. And then slowly, we started uh, changing our process. Like, for me, I've always wanted, like, you know, that there's a this big SEO advice where people are telling you, you should write the best content. And, but it's much easier said than done. So um, what, 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 we, uh, what we did was, um, you know, the obvious uh, things, which was uh, when we had, let's say we want to, to, to write um, an article about web scraping with Ruby. I think uh, we're probably the first uh, 
uh, result for this query, by the way. We looked at uh, every uh, ranking articles about this query on Google, and we try to find um, uh, the gaps. What could we uh, improve? There is one thing that is pretty easy when you are writing about uh, technology. It's that technology is changing at a very, very fast rate. So it's really easy to write an up-to-date article about any kind of uh, technology. That's the first thing. The second thing that you can do to write good technical content or great, even better, great technical content is to change the tone. Like there are many technical articles that are just boring. They are boring because, you know, developers are used to uh, read uh, documentation. Documentation is boring. And when they write a blog post, they just, it, I don't know what happens in their head, but it seems to me that they are writing documentation. So one simple trick is to change your mindset and uh, try to write something that is engaging and that doesn't feel like a documentation. One thing that we did in order to help us with that was to hire a content editor. I highly, highly, highly recommend everyone to hire a content editor, especially if, like myself, you're not a native English speaker. Like a content editor, not only they can help you um, uh, write uh, correct English with the, with the typos, etc., but they can take a boring article and uh, translate it to an engaging one. And that changes everything because... Like, um, you know, sometimes we had comments when we distributed our content on Reddit, et cetera, like, uh, oh, this is so well written, blah, blah, blah. And it, like, it has a big impact, I think. It has a big impact uh, on like um, how much shares will you have on your articles. Um, it will have an impact on your bounce rate. It will have an impact on many things. So um, I highly, highly recommend everyone to do it. Well, a lot of, a lot of really good points. So, so definitely... I I very often feel Google, what, what, it's really hard for Google to figure out what good content is, right? So as long as you, you tick the, the main boxes you should be ticking in this topic, your niche, my personal theory is it, Google just checks user signals. So they just randomly show sites and see what happens. Do they come back? Do they not come back? How long do they stay? What do they do? My personal theory, I don't confirm it that way, but I think a lot, a big part of the algorithm is just how do people feel when they come to a website? And what, what kind of um, feeling do they get? We saw, and this also gets confirmed with some clients where I say, look, before we do anything else, let's change the header and redesign it because it's just mm, awful and people are going to jump off. They're not even going to read the text you have or the title you put in there because it just mm -hmm. doesn't look serious. Uh, very, a lot of this, I think, is just really based on, on user experience. And I can imagine that engaging content, um, first of all, is... Is great for a change if you're a developer or a tech person and you're used to the documentation and you finally find an article that's really nice to read on top of uh, giving information, it's, it's definitely working. And I like the other point you made about the, this example about the introduction to, to scraping for the programming languages. It's very much ties into what we call topical mapping. So mean, mm -hmm. meaning you, you map out a topic and try to, to cover everything around this topic, ideally, especially if you see as you're starting to get some traction, you really want to go. Um, a mile deep, so to speak, and, and just really cover it inside out rather than touching upon all kinds of different queries. If you find, okay, this introduction with the programming language works, then do this for everything. If you have a location page and do that works, uh, try to target more locations. So we see a lot of success here with clients as well, where it's just like, if you're already ranking decently with this, really explore this, make, sell, make sure you establish yourself as a topic, topical authority there. So there is a, a thing called topical trust. So if there is if there is a lot of content about a particular topic, Google is going to see you as a higher authority than someone who just mentioned this briefly on an article. I always mm -hmm. tell people that if I was going to give advice on cancer treatment tomorrow on SEO leverage, hopefully Google wouldn't rank me because I don't know what I'm talking about. But we do know a thing or two about SEO and Shopify SEO and, and these kinds of things. And we have a lot of content there. So Google can understand that it makes sense to rank us for these kinds of terms, uh, you mentioned you mentioned uh, so this this uh, content editor role we have this uh, implemented at some point in house as well to have someone only focusing on the quality rather than the SEO related stuff. And we can certainly confirm this uh, works wonders. What what else would would be would be important if you write for a technic or uh, tech savvy audience, so to speak? Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, I think w when you like when you when you do content marketing for a technical audience, 
uh, one of the most important thing is to like provide as much uh, value as you can and not advertise your product in any way because developers especially they hate uh, marketing like if they feel that your content is some kind of marketing and that you're trying to sell them something um, th they're going to hate it Th that's just the way it is and 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 you and you won't be able to distribute it um, uh, on reddit you won't be able um, to to get your um, content on the front page of hacker news you, you won't be able to like they will really really um, um, badly react to it so one thing that we did is and like from day one is that we uh, we didn't uh, implement any of the usual um, I would say marketing um, uh, technique or growth hacks on our blog for example um, we have um, a free ebook on our blog um, and we just give it for free without having without even uh, asking for an email address and why we do that it's because if you like maybe this is work I mean it's clearly a great uh, lead magnet in many industries, but in tech, like it, it, it doesn't work with developers. It works maybe with uh, executive and decision makers, like uh, product managers, CTOs, whatever. You can uh, write um, uh, an ebook about high level stuff, but for um, uh, the developer audience, it doesn't work at all. And that's my advice uh, when you're doing um, content marketing uh, targeted at developers is. Uh, forget about uh, all the uh, conversion rate optimization uh, techniques. Forget about um, uh, you know um, email gating your content. Forget about um, uh, big CTAs and uh, all that. All those things it, it won't work with developers. And we've tested this uh, many times. And sometimes even this a slight like um, a little mention to your product inside the blog post can be. Uh, badly received by the developer community they just they don't they don't like it and especially on social platforms like uh, reddit hack news um lobster and all those um, um link aggregation platform which are by the way uh, really huge um it's a huge marketing channel for example uh we front page hacker news several times each time it's like uh, 30 000 visitors to our website it's like insane and i'm not sure if i if there are many industries where you have uh, those kind of um um uh, aggregation platform that can uh send so much traffic to your website mm -hmm. for free mm -hmm. and how did you get there you get there by only providing value no marketing trick no conversion rate optimization trick uh, only like a pure um long form tutorials uh, without asking for anything and and then you you get their attention and in the end that's what we want we want to uh like the the the, um, the goal of um, our content strategy is not direct conversion but it's more like brand awareness and and long term like the same way that you know it's the same strategy that is used by digital ocean for example digital ocean they have this. They have an open writing program where they basically pay three hundred dollars to for anyone to write uh, a technical article on the blog, and they rank for like a, a many many. Uh, like I think when you look for uh, anything in Google related to servers, deployment, etc., you will find uh, something written by uh, DigitalOcean. But th there's no uh, mention of DigitalOcean in those articles. It's just meant for long-term brand awareness. And someday when you need uh, a VPS or a server or whatever, you'll think about DigitalOcean and it just works. Absolutely. I think, yeah, we, we definitely do have, in other niches, we do know those CTAs work. We do know the conversion rate optimization works. But I think it goes down back to really know your, know your audience really well, right? I mean, even if you got the email addresses, I bet nine out of 10 email addresses are fake if you have developers. Putting, yeah. putting their email address in because every developer I know has, has probably 25 different email addresses. So the opt-in wouldn't be worth anything anyway. So the only thing you can really squeeze out there is a is an, um, a download of the brand awareness. But we have also seen this working. I remember we did this in 
I think this was an office refurbishment project in Austria uh, where we just mm-hmm. offered the catalog for free because it was clear that people were going to download the catalog. They were going, were going to print it. They were going to take it to their next meeting. So we didn't want to put any boundaries there. And maybe then you have deliverability issues. So you should ask them for a double verification or all those kinds of kinds of barriers. At the end of the day, you want to make it easy for people to, to buy from you and, and make a, a selection. And I think there's also a lot to say about about just establishing yourself as an authority over the long term. People are like really eager, like yeah, I write a blog post today and tomorrow I should be ranking number one and and I should see my leads coming in because otherwise I don't write another blog post. It's just a long game. <laughs> so yeah. you really need to need to look into into what what kind of business you want to build because very often if you frame it the wrong way, we just see the results are not coming through at all. Um so, so yeah, definitely congrats on, on the long-term view. And obviously the Hacker News front page is definitely a really good achievement. And I can see how this puts some spikes into your revenue graphics. Awesome. Um, I want to slowly wrap this up. We already consumed quite some, uh, quite a bit of your time and I appreciate it. Um, if someone listening to this wants to grow their software as a service business, what kind of advice could you give them with your experience now if they want to take SEO or content marketing seriously to grow their business? I would say uh, several things. The first thing is that if you have product market fit and uh, you, you understand and you notice that there is some search volume for, that, for keywords that have some business value uh, for your business, you, you have to, like, for me, uh, SEO is a no-brainer. It's like, I like to think of SEO uh, as uh, gardening, uh, as opposed to, let's say, uh, um, cold outreach would, would be like uh, fishing. Um, and if, uh, for me, um, SEO fits really well with my personality because I really like to stack things, you know. Um, uh, I really like to uh, build something for the long term. And that's uh, what SEO is in the end. So to be um, uh, more uh, actionable, um, I would say that uh, you should start with uh, the course from HREF, Blogging for Businesses. Uh, in my opinion, it's wh- it's one of the most, um, like it's the best um, uh, SEO course for SaaS businesses on the internet. It's only like uh, four hours long. It will be the, I think the um, the highest um, uh, ROI uh, you will get uh, from your time for your SaaS business, uh, like it will be the the uh, very um, well spent four hours. Uh, they will teach you everything from um, uh, keyword research to how to build uh, um, you know content briefs, uh, how to write good content, uh, like the, the, all the technical. Uh, uh, the how-to will be answered uh, in this course, and I uh, highly recommend it. Uh, they will teach you how to build links. They will t- teach you basically everything. And then the 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 but when you like, there are lots of people who followed this course and still failed at SEO. And I think the the, the number one reason is that it's like people lacks consistency. And they, as you mentioned earlier, they expect uh, to rank first uh, immediately and to get results immediately. And unfortunately, it will take uh, a lot of time. It will take a lot of time for you to write a lot of content. It will take a lot of time for you to build great backlinks. Um, In order to build great backlinks, you need to first build great relationships and it doesn't happen overnight. And so my advice is just like, First, you need to find product market fit. And then when you have product market fit, and if in your industry there is enough search volume, because it's not the case in every industry, mm-hmm. then go for it and and you know target the long term. Uh, it's a long-term game, and you just have to be consistent and and enjoy the process. This is amazing. I definitely, definitely vote for enjoy the process. It's a long game. <laughs> it's definitely something you cannot um, just... Uh, press a few buttons and, and expect those results. Uh, I want to wrap this up a little bit. We've learned a lot and I appreciate your, your 
you're openly sharing your your story and and what you have learned here as well we learned that how important it is to know really your audience what can what you can ask what they do appreciate what they don't appreciate uh this might as well impact how much how much shares you get how often you are mentioned how often you're cited how how engaged people are with this content you talked about the content editor role as one essential piece to make sure that someone really cares about how is this actually being read not not what information needs to be in there but this is actually reader friendly is this engaging enough for people to actually like it because this might then trigger some other signals on google if if people really enjoy the content um, you talked about a long-term view, which definitely is in line with what we try to achieve here, where we say, okay, like SEO is just something you're going to do. It's not going to have, a, there's not going to be an ROI calculation where you say, I'm going to put X amount into SEO and I'm getting, getting X amount out. It's just not the way SEO works because it's just every, every keyword triggers a different set of algorithm layers in, in Google. It's just too complex to, to have a clear calculation. I think we see a lot of people coming from uh, social media advertising and they roughly have an idea that if they spend X amount, usually they get X amount of leads at a certain price and they kind of want to give this this mold. They want to put it on, on top of SEO and say, okay, now I need to have SEO fit into my formula and my spreadsheet. It just mm-hmm. doesn't work this way. However, we also know that consistency, uh, which is what we're trying to support here with our ongoing consulting framework and our app as well, just to make sure that the consistent efforts are working and, and work in the right direction. So we don't do anything what, that might not have an impact, but do the things that actually uh, do work really consistently over time. We know that consistent implementation just works. And this is where then the client, some clients get $5,000 email opt-ins, not from developers, from other, other people. Um, or, or get those leads, get those sales in on their e-commerce sites, and it just works. So that definitely a lot goes back to the brand awareness to build, to the goodwill you build with your audience over time. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kevin, for joining us here today. Uh, we're going to make well, sure that... Thanks so much for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk and, and definitely interested in this uh, thing all together. We're going to host this uh, podcast episode over at seoleverage.com forward slash podcast. Find it at episode 89. We're going to also write a, put up a written summary of what we talked about, the main points, main takeaways. We're going to link to the Ahrefs uh, course as well. Ahrefs is definitely, unfortunately, when I started SEO 20 years ago, Ahrefs wasn't wasn't around instructing everybody. But this, today, I agree, it's definitely one of the main sources of information. And when we bring on trainees in SEO leverage, part of apart from my own training program, part of this is definitely have them check out what Ahrefs puts out because it's definitely high quality material and, and uh, Tim Solo and his team there know definitely what they're doing. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you.